Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our uh, advanced practice provider grand rounds for University Hospitals Health System. Today, I'm delighted to have Dr. Emily McDonald from Canada here with us today to talk about deprescribing. Uh, Dr. McDonald's is the Associate Professor of Medicine and Subspecialist in General Internal Medicine at McGill University in Canada. She is the Associate Chair of Quality and Safety for the Department of Medicine and Scientific Director of the Canadian Medication Appropriateness and Deprescribing Network. Dr. McDonald completed postgraduate training in epidemiology at McGill University and the program in clinical effectiveness at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. She is the co-founder of MedSafer, a software guide to, for clinicians for the process of deprescribing. Um, if you Google Scholar her, you'll find many uh, studies and research she's been involved with including um, outpatient treatments for COVID-19, and um, th those were the most recent ones, and, and as well as deprescribing. I came upon her because someone mentioned um, the deprescribing network in Canada on a podcast I was listening to, and because there's a keen interest on improving patients' quality of life through deprescribing, multiple medications, I cold emailed them and asked if someone would be willing to talk. And Dr. McDonald volunteered graciously pro bono to speak with us today. So thank you, Dr. McDonald, for being here and take it away. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, just a little caveat, I have a bit of a cold, so I'm sorry if my uh, for my voice or if I uh, cough a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll get through this hour and have fun together, I'm sure. So these are my disclosures. I'm the scientific director of the Canadian Medication Appropriateness and Deprescribing. There are other deprescribing networks around the world now. So there's a U.S. deprescribing research network, Australian. Um, there's also the Northern European researchers in deprescribing or the NERD network. Uh, so deprescribing has really taken off around the world. And so I'm here representing the Canadian network. Uh, I live in Quebec, uh, which is uh, one of the provinces in Canada. And I'm a member of uh, one of our uh, national uh, committees that decides which medications uh, get onto our uh, healthcare formulary and are paid for by the province. And my views today are my own. Uh, I'm the co-inventor of MedSafer. So it's a software that helps guide deprescribing, um, and I own the intellectual property with my colleague in McGill University, uh, and I'm the chief executive officer of MedSafer Corp, which licenses the software. I have public funding um, from CHR Canada uh, and other public funding agencies. Uh, I don't have any ties with the pharmaceutical or uh, industry, and I have salary support from uh, the province of Quebec to support research. So um, some objectives for today are to come away being able to list um, what really populations are most affected by inappropriate prescriptions and uh, you know, understand some of the barriers to deprescribing that we encounter in everyday clinical practice, and then come away with three, and I think maybe even I listed four or five practical tools that prescribers can access to help overcome some of these barriers. So I do wanna differentiate before we start the difference between polypharmacy and what I'll call medication overload. So in the literature and research, you'll see a lot of reference to polypharmacy, which is taking multiple medications. And often studies of deprescribing will identify populations of patients based on the title polypharmacy. Um, and you know, typically that's been people taking five or more meds. As time has gone by, um, many, many people meet this definition now, um, people over the age of 65, it's very common. And in fact, five medications can be indicated and beneficial. I have many patients who have transplant, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, HIV, who are on dialysis, who have polypharmacy, and it's entirely indicated. What we're really trying to address with deprescribing is what I'll call medication overload. And this is where you have medications where um, some of them, the risk is greater than the benefit. We know this. Some of them, it requires more judgment and we have to really balance the risks and benefits. And then there are other medications that, you know, 
incredibly just don't work. They add to pill burden, there are studies showing that they have no effect or that they're harmful. And yet perhaps they were prescribed many years ago and continue to be re-prescribed. Uh, or there's a lack of knowledge about how to get people off some of these medications. Um, so, you know, these are the different meds that contribute to medication overload and pill burden, which is what we're really trying to address with deprescribing. So I'm going to start with a patient story. It's a personal patient story. So this is my grandmother. Um, so her name's Nora McDonald. She uh, lives in, uh, in Asuyas in British Columbia. Um, so wine country, it's very hot there. She had uh, her own land. She was living autonomously uh, into her mid nineties, looking after the area, tending to the garden. Um, when she had a fall about two years ago, she was admitted to the hospital and in the hospital, she was found to, to have a bleed in her brain. Um, she developed pneumonia and she was in the hospital for about six weeks. And uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to return back home. So this is a common story for older adults. Um, being admitted to the hospital can be a, a life-changing event, right? And she was not able to return to being her autonomous self. Um, which, you know, understandable to an extent because she was in her 90s and she'd had a big hospitalization. Um, but I do want to show you uh, her medication list. So when she left the hospital, she left on three new medications. So one of them is clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. One of them is codeine, and she was in a long-acting and a short-acting formulation, and that's an opioid. Um, and another one is trazodone, which is an antidepressant uh, that is sometimes used off-label for sleep. Um, when she was discharged from the hospital, she was admitted to a nursing home. And my uncle, who lives in the area, was very concerned, and he emailed me and said, um, you know, she can't knit anymore, she's not able to go to the bathroom, she can't do jigsaw puzzles, all these things that she had done, you know, six to eight weeks before she was admitted to the hospital. Um, and this is what she looked like the day she was admitted to the nursing home. So not a very happy camper. Um, what we did was uh, we decided that we would try and get her off some of these medications, um, realistically, because we said, you know, maybe she'll get a little bit better and maybe she'll be able to interact a bit more if she's not on these medications, which have these very sedating side effects, especially in an older person, especially in combination. So this is her one year after she was admitted to the nursing home. Um, and it took about that time to get her off these medications. So we did pretty slow tapers because we didn't want to cause her any rebound symptoms. And we worked together uh, with the nursing home doctor who was really uh, very helpful and amenable to this. They were interested and open to deprescribing, which is great. Um, and uh, by the time we got her off the medications, she was left on, I think, melatonin for sleep um, and an inhaler, Spiriva or Tiotropium, uh, which was for her emphysema that she was known for. So this is a picture of her playing the card game uh, Rummy, um, which she learned newly after she came off the medication. So she'd never played Rummy in her life, um, but my uncle taught her how to play it and she was able to win when she played him. And maybe that says more about my uncle's lack of talent with Rummy, but I think you can see there's a very different look in her eyes and she's a lot more bright and interactive. So this was to us um, a deprescribing success. Um, we didn't know that this would be the outcome, but we never would have achieved this if we hadn't tried and given her a chance. So uh, we do say that polypharmacy is an, is an epidemic. I know that can be kind of overused as a term, but it really is the case for polypharmacy. Three out of five older adults, and you know, generally that means people over the age of 65 uh, are prescribed far or more drug classes. And one in four older adults, about 24% are prescribed 10 or more drug classes. This comes from um, our country level data in Canada, and it is uh, exactly the same in the United States. So this is a problem across North America and, and around the world. So there are certain populations where this is an even greater problem and it's more common. So we have to pay attention to people who live in rural regions. Um, women are prescribed more medication than men, people who live in low income neighborhoods, and also people who are residing in long term care. Uh, sometimes people in nursing homes are taking 13, 14, 15, 20 
25 uh, medications a day. And if you think about that, that's just medication classes. So if some of those meds are being prescribed two to three times a day, the number of pills um, is, is incredible. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine. Um, we do know that the number of drugs prescribed is the factor that is most responsible for hospitalizations due to adverse drug events or side effects from medications. This makes sense, of course. The more medications you have, the more likely you are to have a side effect from the medication, and the more likely the medications will interact and cause uh, adverse drug events. So while there are people who are on many medications, and again, they can be helpful and indicated, it's a flag um, that this person might be at risk for adverse drug events, and that maybe if you took a look, there might be one or more of those medications that is inappropriate for that person. And in fact, the majority of people, probably around 75 to 80 percent who are taking more than five drugs, we can find one med uh, that they don't need to take anymore uh, or that isn't helpful or that might even be harmful. So adverse drug events are the biggest complication that we see from polypharmacy, but there are also other considerations such as pill burden um, and side effects that may not necessarily um, be dangerous, but that they can be a, a nuisance for the person. So some people who take a lot of medications will lose their appetite because pills basically replace their meal. Some people have nausea, they won't eat as much. And sometimes if you're taking 10 medications, it can be difficult to know um, you know, that that side effect that someone is experiencing is from the medication. And then there are outright medication complications, adverse drug events that are very common, that are increasing in frequency. They are costing a lot of money to the person, the healthcare system, and they're quite harmful. So this is some data from the Lown Institute. Um, and the Lown Institute did a sort of enquete, um, so an investigation into polypharmacy in the United States. Uh, it was about three years ago now, but it's been published online. There's a white paper where they sought out some statistics for just how harmful uh, polypharmacy and adverse drug events are. So I already talked about how common it is, but what they found was that there had been an increase for 20 years, 200%. Um, and then in 2018, 5 million older adults in the United States sought medical attention because of adverse drug events. Um, there were 280,000 hospitalizations that were being reported each year from adverse drug events. And they estimated that over about 10 years, there had been $62 billion spent in unnecessary hospitalizations. I think the key here is that not only are these adverse drug events common, costly, and harmful, um, but many of them are preventable. So based on these numbers, they estimated that over the next 10 years, there would be 150,000 premature deaths uh, amongst older adults due to adverse drug events. So this is something that we want to intervene on. So I want to give you some practical examples of adverse drug events that I see when I work in the emergency room. So I'm an internist, and I work in the emergency room a couple of times a month where I see patients who are being hospitalized to the internal medicine unit. And I would say every month I see people that come in with these side effects. So we have um, patients who come in with severe constipation or respiratory depression from opioids. And there was a study um, published in JAMA that showed that people who come in with an opioid overdose uh, requiring medical attention, the majority of them leave the hospital on the same dose of opioids. Hypoglycemia from diabetic agents. So the you know, care of diabetes has really changed quite a bit in the last five years. And there are quite a lot of newer agents for diabetes and older agents that still exist that don't cause hypoglycemia. And yet we continue to see older adults prescribe medications that give them low blood glucose, make them feel unwell, um, and can affect their cognition, lead to falls and other complications. Um, there's a class of medications that's commonly prescribed in North America. Uh, it is one of the top 10 most prescribed medications in the United States. It's called, uh, they're called gabapentinoids. So gabapentinoids are a class of medication that were originally um, marketed for epilepsy. And uh, they are often prescribed uh, both on-label and off-label to treat pain. And not everybody is aware of some of the complications that these drugs can cause. So they can, um, for example, lead to peripheral edema, and that can lead to diuretic use. And that's just one of the more benign complications that they cause, but they can uh, commonly be responsible for what's called prescription cascades, where the drug causes a side effect, and the side effect gets treated by another drug. 
as opposed to looking at the original cause for the side effect and reevaluating that medication. Fall with hip fracture. Of course, this is unfortunately very commonly seen uh, with patients who are taking sedative hypnotics or combinations of sedative hypnotics and opioids. Um, people can take these medications for many years and they have an intercurrent illness that makes them a little bit sicker. Maybe they get a little bit dehydrated. Maybe they don't process that medication in the body as well. And even though they've tolerated it for 20 years, they can have an intercurrent illness. And then that medication can contribute to a fall and a fracture. Fall with hip fracture in an older adult, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, it has a, has a mortality associated with it. Finally, we do see a lot of people coming in who are taking two or three blood thinners. And there are some indications to take combination blood thinners, but there aren't that many. And a lot of times this combination of medication gets continued beyond the originally indicated duration. So someone got prescribed two blood thinners for a stent and it was intended to be prescribed for six to 12 months, but it never got reevaluated. The person didn't have a complication. So it continued to get prescribed and until they come in with a complication from the two uh, blood thinners and sometimes three blood thinners. So I want to propose to you that what all of these adverse drug events have in common is that one, they're frequent. Uh, I see these all the time in the emergency room. They're predictable. I know that these are common side effects of these medications. And because they're predictable, I would propose that they're preventable. Um, and again, just to go back to my grandmother, they can be life altering, right? They can lead to unnecessary hospitalizations, which can result in reduced autonomy and reduced quality of life. So uh, as an example, if someone comes in with a, a gastrointestinal bleed from taking two blood thinners, we have lots of medical advancements that can treat that gastrointestinal bleed. We can give them proton pump inhibitors. We can do a gastroscopy. If they have an ulcer, we can inject it. We can stop the bleeding. We can transfuse them. So although we are able uh, very, very well to reverse the adverse drug event itself, there is still hospitalization associated with it. Uh, time spent in bed, time spent not mobilizing. Um, and for an older adult, this can lead to um, a, a change in their living situation and in their cognition, uh, especially if they develop delirium, for example, in the hospital. Uh, this is an older study um, that was done uh, by my colleagues, Steve Morgan and Kara Tannenbaum, um, where they looked at the cost of uh, inappropriate medications in Canada and in the United States. Um, and they found that when they looked at just six provinces out of our 10 and the American Geriatric Society list for inappropriate medications, um, they estimated that in Canada, our government was spending about $75 per older Canadian or about $419 million uh, a year just in the cost of the medication. So that's the direct costs. This is 10 years ago and it's Canadian data. So now you're going to inflate this potentially by 50 or more to represent the different costs that you might see in the United States. These were our uh, indirect costs from these medications. So things like falls and hospitalizations. And then, you know, projected to the United States, this was over $4 billion uh, spent on indirect costs. And again, this is data from about 10 years ago. And so we can only imagine that this has gotten, um, the amount is even higher now. And that, you know, the payer is different in the United States. So that some of these costs are being borne by patients themselves. So uh, we do have uh, right now at the Canadian uh, Medication Appropriateness and Deprescribing Network a visiting professor and pharmacist. And so, you know, at our network, we do accept trainees and visiting professors who come and work with us. Um, and Professor Yuan is visiting from France, and he's actually going to be redoing the cost of inappropriate medications paper. Um, so he's going to take a look at the new updated uh, criteria from the American, American Geriatric Society and link that to our country level data on inappropriate prescriptions. Um, there will be some limits to this evaluation because we're not able to link with patient conditions. Um, and we're going to have to define what we think a chronic prescription is based on our administrative data. And certainly it can be challenging to you know, calculate the indirect costs for hundreds of drugs. But I think one of the strengths that's gonna come out of this paper is that we're gonna have more up-to-date data on the cost of these medications um, in both the United States and Canada. We're also gonna be able to include data from long-term care, um, which is often omitted from these analyses. 
So uh, I mentioned the Lown Institute. This is a photo um, that they have provided us with uh, when we do talks on deprescribing. Um, and it was actually the Lown Institute that came up with the term medication overload from talking to patients. So they met with patients and they proposed the term uh, polypharmacy and patients said, um, that has no meaning to me. I don't know what that means. So, you know, this is medication overload. It's actually a term that's been uh, vetted and decided on uh, with patient input. So I would encourage you to use it uh, when talking with patients because oftentimes um, they may not understand what polypharmacy is. Um, so one of the solutions is deprescribing. So this is a real patient with their medications before and after deprescribing. So you can see what a big pill burden they had before. And, you know, just visually, it's very striking what you can achieve with deprescribing. So, okay, why not just do it for everybody, right? It seems simple enough, but of course, like everything in medicine, there are several barriers to deprescribing. So first, one of the things you may be familiar with is that there's actually hundreds of rules from multiple professional societies. So I'll name just three to start with. There's the American Geriatric Society criteria. There's criteria called the STOP criteria from Australia. And there are also recommendations from Choosing Wisely Canada. And uh, there are other professional societies from other countries that have come up with their own lists of appropriate prescriptions. So it's actually a lot of information to learn. So that means it requires specialized medical expertise. And the problem here is that deprescribing is not emphasized in the medical curriculum. So across different practices, uh, advanced practitioners, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, doctors, primary care physicians, specialists, this is not something that's emphasized in the medical curriculum. We are really focused on learning how to prescribe, um, but there's very little in the curriculum about how to get people off of vacations. And so to deprescribe, we often rely on people with this specialized medical expertise. So pharmacists who may have trained um, geriatric uh, nurse practitioners, um, the specialty of geriatrics, these specialties may have learned how to get off these med get people off these medications, but the the human resources are not universally available. So when we look at our medical inpatient unit, for example, we may have one pharmacist. Um, they're not usually there on the weekend. There are units in our hospital that don't have a pharmacist. Uh, nursing homes sometimes will have one pharmacist covering who comes once a month and manages sometimes hundreds or thousands of patients um, across their capture area. Um, so now add in the complexity that patients who take 10 or more medications often have 10 or more medical conditions. So if you're starting to do the mutation in your head, you've got 10 medications, 10 medical conditions, 100 rules for deprescribing. So you can start to see that the different permutations um, are, are quite burdensome to learn. And if you had to sit down and cross-reference, this would be time consuming. And so while we uh, may want to deep prescribe, we don't always have the time to do it because we don't always have an hour to sit down and um, look at a med list and the medical complexities and come up with a plan for deep prescribing. The other thing is that prescribers may fear stopping medications. And, and these are just some barriers. There's actually many more. Um, doctors and prescribers may fear stopping medications because first of all, we aren't always the one who started the medication. And so we may hesitate to stop a medication we don't feel ownership over. Or for example, if we're not the specialist, um, we might worry about stopping a medication without, for example, getting the input of the cardiologist, if we're talking about two blood thinners, for example. Um, so, you know, these are all the challenges, but I do want to point out some successes um, because there is progress being made in this field. And yes, there's still a lot of work to do, but I want to point out that, you know, in Canada, we actually have some champion provinces who have been able to achieve um, some really low rates of inappropriate prescribing. So if we take a look at the province of Saskatchewan, which is in the middle of Canada, they actually have a very low proportion of sleeping pills for older adults. And they only had about 5.4% of people who were taking these medications. And if we look above here, um, our national average is about 8%. And if we look back to five, six, seven years ago, the national average was 10%. So we are making progress. We've come down over the last few years and people taking sleeping pills. And we do have promises we can use as our goal, right? This is what's achievable. Um, 
we have to remember, of course, that sometimes when you come off of sleeping pills, uh, we're very creative as prescribers. And so we will replace them with other medications that have sedating side effects, right? So, you know, even if you see a province or a state or an area or a hospital that's coming down in their rate of benzos, for example, you have to be uh, keen uh, and look at the other medications that we know prescribers love to use to replace these with. So things like antipsychotics, antidepressants, medications like um, diphenhydramine, uh, where the side effect is sedation. Uh, so, you know, prescribers can be tricky. So when we're looking at this data, we always have to take it with a grain of salt. So I want to give you a practical approach to deprescribing. It's a, it is a large topic, but I want to just give you some practical resources and tell you a little bit about my experience in the hospital and what I've learned. So my approach um, to deprescribing changes a bit based on where the patient is located, because that changes usually how acute the presentation is, how much time I have, um, and the urgency to deprescribe. And I do uh, have a big practice that takes place in the emergency department and on the inpatient unit, uh, which is actually arguably uh, a more challenging place to deprescribe because for one, the person may be acutely sick, right? So there's competing priorities. Um, I, I'm not the primary prescriber. I may not be the one to follow them up if I stop the medication. So these are some of the things that I have to overcome if I'm gonna deprescribe in the environment where I work. If you're working in the clinic or in a community practice, you have um, the ability, hopefully, to see the person longitudinally, so you can follow them up um, to make sure that they don't have rebound side effects. Um, you can develop a, a good patient relationship, um, a trusting relationship, such that the person is more amenable to deprescribing. And so, I, you know, I look at these two environments as very different in terms of the opportunities and the challenges for deprescribing. So. Uh, hospitalization for me starts in the emergency department. In the emergency department, as I said, adverse drug events are very common. They're often the reason the person comes to the emergency department to begin with. And I do see this as an opportunity to deprescribe. So if someone has an adverse drug event in particular, I always like to teach um, the residents and the trainees uh, to consider, is there a way it could have been prevented? And what can we do to avoid a repeat event? Because this is really key. A lot of times I see an adverse drug event and in the plan for the patient, I'll see something that maybe hedges a little bit, like consider stopping the second antiplatelet medication. Um, and I try to encourage them to, um, you know, just close the loop and take it a step further um, as opposed to shifting the responsibility. So we'll try and call the cardiologist and say, listen, this person's been on the medication for more than 12 months and now they have a bleeding event, would you be okay if we stop their clopidogrel? So try to go that extra mile when somebody's already suffered harm, because I think it's a real shame, because of course I do see them six months later coming back um, with a second episode, and sometimes it's worse than the first. So um, here's some practical presentations that one could consider intervening on for someone who is presenting to the hospital. So we talked about um, GI bleeding, also uh, low blood sugar. I think that's a common one. If someone's coming in sick, it's tempting to say they're sick and so that's why their blood sugar is low, but there are clearly safer drug classes. And so uh, why test it? If someone has come in with an episode of blood, low blood glucose and there's a safer medication class uh, with appropriate coverage that the patient can have access to, uh, I would encourage people to switch um, right away and not wait for it to happen again or, or assume that it's just from the critical illness um, since there is an alternative that's safer. Falls from CNS sedating medications, whether they're injurious or not, is always an opportunity to speak with the patient and the family about coming off some of those medications. Delirium, um, even if it's from an intercurrent illness like a pneumonia, it is definitely an opportunity to take a look at those medications that contribute like anticholinergic, opioids, gabapentinoids, antipsychotics. And yes, it could help the um, immediate event and also it could prevent it from happening in the future. Because once someone develops delirium, you know, we know they're at risk of it happening again. And, uh, you know, it is a matter of time before they'll come back to the hospital or they'll have del delirium in the future. And so we want to try and optimize that situation and um, try and avoid delirium from happening because it can really um, it can cause permanent damage to the brain. And not everybody comes back to how they were before or after an episode of delirium. 
Um, it's, you know, increasingly recognized and even starting to be labeled as a medical emergency because we know that it has permanent effects and that they're not always reversible. So any delirium, I take the opportunity to look at delirium inducing drugs and try and help people to come off of them. And then another one that's common in the hospital is nausea and gastrointestinal upset um, or weight loss. I see a lot of older adults who present to the hospital and um, there's a big investigation done for uh, looking for a, you know, a hidden or an occult cancer. Um, and when we take a look at their medications, uh, they could be contributing to decreased appetite. Um, for example, cholinesterase inhibitors, it's kind of a, a little known side effect, but these can cause a lot of na nausea and gastrointestinal upset. And there are some people who benefit, but there are others who clearly don't, or they've, um, they've derived the benefit. Um, and so when you want to optimize quality of life, that could be a really good moment to, uh, to consider deprescribing cholinesterase inhibitors. So I mentioned that I um, developed a software called MedSafer, um, which helps clinicians deprescribe. So I'll tell you a little bit about it um, and the trial that we ran with MedSafer in the hospital. So um, MedSafer is basically decision support um, that helps you do the cross-referencing part of a deprescribing checkup. Um, it'll look for deprescribing opportunities. It'll it basically generates a kind of roadmap for how to deprescribe by cross-referencing people's medical conditions, lab values, their med list, their life expectancy, and their frailty. Um, and uh, it can link with the electronic medical record. Um, we included all of the different criteria from the American Geriatric Society and STOP and Choosing Wisely, and also from the network, um, Canadian Deprescribing Network. So basically how it works is if you're using MedSafer, you can log in to the application, enter in the person's medications and their medical history, and then the MedSafer um, API will send back a report. So I'm going to tell you how we studied this in the hospital. Um, and it's really, it's one tool, but there are many tools for deprescribing. So I'm going to tell you about other tools that exist as well. Um, so this is a, you know, a sample report. Uh, we actually ran MedSafer uh, in a large randomized control trial in the hospital in Canada. And we published in JAMA Internal Medicine in uh, January of 2022, our results. And all we did was we looked at usual care. So we looked at people admitted to the hospital to see what happened to them. And then we compared it to the intervention, which was basically just giving the team a deprescribing report. So a little prompt. Um, we classify drugs into high risk, intermediate risk. So here's some like examples of intermediate risk, like PPIs, right? We know that they're not high risk, but over time they can contribute to um, some long-term complications. And there are many people who take PPIs without any evidence-based indication. Lots of guidelines to say, you know, use them for two weeks, once a year, you should always reassess them. And yet we do see many people who are continued on them for, for years and years without ever trying to come off. And we give tapering instructions. So we link to some of our brochures, um, which I'm going to tell you about in a bit, but they're called patient empower brochures. And these uh, are printed and we hand them directly to the patient and the family. And they also provide them with information about why some medications might be harmful. Um, it uses cognitive dissonance. So it, uh, there's a, a quiz, you know, where the person taking the medication answers some questions about, you know, whether or not they think the medication is safe and why it might not be. And then there's also a nice tapering regimen. So I'll tell you a bit more about those, but the, we paired this with the intervention. Um, so first we ran a pilot study, and this is dating back a few years ago now, and we published that in the Journal of American Geriatric Society. And we got some interesting results when we gave people these deprescribing reports. And at the time, the government of Canada uh, was really focused on getting people off antipsychotics. So you can really see here that the audience was primed to deprescribe antipsychotics because that's where we saw our biggest effect um, from the intervention. And we had about a number needed to treat of 12. So we'd give out 12 reports and one patient would have a potentially inappropriate medication um, deprescribed at hospital discharge. We had about an annual cost savings, about $100 per patient exposed. And if you go back to that study by Kara Tannenbaum and the cost of PIMS, that's about the cost per patient, right? So kind of interesting that those two things aligned. And a number needed to treat is interesting, but not um, astounding. 
So we decided to do a, a bigger study and we wanted to randomize it. The study in the pilot was a before and after study, so not the strongest methodology. So we went on to do a clinical trial where we uh, had 11 hospitals and we put them into clusters uh, based on geography in Canada. So a Western cluster, a cluster in Quebec and in Ontario. And we actually wanted the trial to reduce adverse drug events. So we uh, powered it to decrease adverse drug events at 30 days post-hospital discharge. So that meant we needed close to 6,000 participants, uh, which we were able to achieve. And you know, when we looked at the literature, the study, we started it back in 2015, the most common literature cited for adverse drug events is from um, Alan Forster, who's a Canadian uh, physician in Ottawa. And at the time, he had published quite a bit on adverse drug events and was estimating that there was about 16% of patients who had adverse drug events when they were discharged from the hospital. So we wanted to reduce this to about 12%. So we actually completed our enrollment and we adjudicated all of the adverse drug events and we published the trial, which was, uh, and it was very complex when we were looking at the patient files and trying to adjudicate adverse drug events, it was so hard to tell what had brought the patient into the hospital. So it, it really is, these are complicated patients. Um, we have a scale of adverse drug events that we use for trials, where a five and a six are pure adverse drug events. They say, I know for certain that this, you know, this event was due to a drug. And in fact, you know, it's not so easy. When we have patients who are admitted to the hospital, certainly drugs contribute, but so do many other factors. Uh, readmission is very complex. So this is, you know, for you to take a look at what the population looked like but we actually approached close to 12,000 patients. This, was, this is actually the biggest deprescribing study that's ever been published. Um, and we ended up uh, with our, uh, this is what we wanted to achieve, which is about 6,000 people in the study. And we actually phoned them at 30 days after they left the hospital. And we did a whole structured interview to see if they'd had an adverse drug event. And so, you know, this is kind of what they looked like. So older, median age of seven, eight, half of them were female. Um, we had some people speaking English and a few people speaking French. Uh, most people were, you know, healthy community dwelling, right? Only about 5% were admitted from a long-term care facility. But look at those drugs, right? Median of 10 medications for people admitted to the hospital. So this is really commonly seen in, uh, in medical patients. And then, um, as I said, for each of these patients, on average, there was about two medications or between one and four for each person that we saw that was potentially inappropriate. So most of the patients in the study ended up getting a deprescribing report. So um, I said to you, I was gonna teach you about the top most common potentially inappropriate medications. And so here they are. Uh, in our population, far and away, we still have a problem with sleeping pills. So benzodiazepines and sedative hypnotics. We have a big issue with proton pump inhibitors. Um, you know, close to 50% of our patients are taking a proton pump inhibitor. Um, and many of them have no indication for it. Some of them do, of course. Uh, that's why these are called potentially inappropriate medications. You really, you have to use some judgment for some of these meds. And then we had a lot of patients who were admitted and their A1C on average was about 6.5%. So older, frail people with overly controlled diabetes. Um, and our society guidelines in Canada say that you really need to factor in someone's age and their frailty when considering their A1C, and that it's entirely appropriate to aim for a higher A1C. Um, you might want to individualize your A1C target and aim for more of a 7.5 to 8 um, in people who have a limited life expectancy or who have had complications from these medications, who are at risk of falls, for example. A lot of these patients had overly controlled diabetes. And then, as I mentioned before, this class of drugs, gabapentinoids, um, about 20% of people in the control arm were taking these medications. Um, again, it's one of the top drugs prescribed in Canada and the US, uh, and not a lot of evidence for effect, but clear evidence for harm. And then we had patients who were taking multiple doses of iron every day. So sometimes two or three times a day. And there are studies that have shown that taking it three times a week 
once daily has just as good, if not better absorption as taking a medication like iron two to three times a day. And we know that iron makes people nauseous um, and it gives them, you know, stomach pain. And so this is a, a good one to uh, intervene on and de-prescribe one if they don't need it at all, or to try and optimize the dose so that they have fewer side effects. Um, so, you know, from our trial, we found that we were able to increase deprescribing, um, but we had no impact on adverse drug events. So we didn't decrease adverse drug events at 30 days post-discharge, um, but we also didn't uh, increase them either. So we had a neutral impact on adverse drug events. Uh, and we also included adverse drug withdrawal events. So, uh, you know, we looked to see when we stopped medications in these patients, if there were harmful outcomes by capturing specifically adverse drug events that came from deprescribing. And there was no increase in adverse deprescribing withdrawal events. So, um, you know, priming a clinician to possibilities uh, for deprescribing is effective. You can come off these medications and it, it doesn't increase uh harmful side effects. And we don't know about the long-term effect on adverse drug events because this study looked at short-term impact, which was neutral. So overall safe and effective to do. And these are the absolute increase. So we increased deprescribing by 22.2% and the number needed to treat for that is about four people. So, you know, a, a bit more interesting than the pilot study um, kind of a low barrier to intervening, but providing a deprescribing report for every four people resulted in um, at least one person having a potentially harmful medication stopped at hospital discharge. So um, I want to give you some other resources for prescribing in the remaining time that we have. And these ones are um, very accessible. So you can go online. They are freely available. So this is from my, uh, my network, the Deprescribing Network in Canada. So that's our website. Now on this website, um, I encourage you to explore it, but there is, first of all, a page for members of the public. So if you have patients, you can absolutely direct them to this webpage. There is a tab that is entirely appropriate for them to explore, which talks about um, taking too many, medication, many medications, how it can impact their memory, um, how it can lead to falls. There are tools about how to sleep well without medications um, and different resources, including the Empower brochures that I talked about. And these are all free. They're translated in different languages and you can download them and you can provide them to your patient. We also have a research tab. So if people are looking to be affiliated as a, um, as a research to the network. We're very inclusive and we invite people to list themselves and if they have a website and an interest in deprescribing, um, you can uh, be included on the website so that people across North America can start to partner together on other trials of deprescribing. And we have our different partners listed. Uh, there are also resources that are directed for Indigenous patients. And as I said, some of the material, uh, quite a bit of it is translated into different languages. And one of our goals for the coming year is to translate our resources into even more languages. Um, so keep an eye on the website because we're going to have uh, more translations available over the next uh, next year coming. So these are the Empower brochures that are available on the website. Um, I like to talk about the Empower brochures because they have been studied in a clinical trial. So these are evidence-based interventions. They're, as I said, patient brochures that can be downloaded and have a quiz and they also give you a tapering regimen and non-pharmacologic alternatives. So like really all those key points that you need to get people off of sleeping pills. And the Empower brochures are available for a number of different medication classes. So we have them for sleeping pills, opioids, gabapentinoids, diabetes medications, um, diphenhydramine. So lots of different ones available. And uh, Dr. Tannenbaum and her group studied these brochures in a randomized trial that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine that, again, showed something similar to the MedSafer study, which was about a number needed to treat of four, right? That's that same number needed to treat, which means if you give the brochure to four people who are willing to accept the brochure, right? So in this study, it was mailed out. And so the person had to take a look at the brochure. Um, you'll, you'll be successful in getting one person off of a sleeping pill, which pretty, like, that's a pretty effective intervention, right? And it tells them to do it um, in a supervised fashion. And supervised fashion um, could mean with the help of their pharmacist, 
uh, advanced care practitioner, specialist, primary care physician, uh, and, and it does give them the regimen uh, for how to taper. And the tapering schedules are very important because they're slow tapers. So not only do they address the side effects that can occur medically when you stop these medications suddenly. So um, if you stop a benzodiazepine, all of a sudden you can develop a seizure, just like alcohol. Um, so the tapering regimen addresses those side effects, but it also addresses the psychological dependency that people uh, develop on these medications. And it will give advice for how to go back. Um, if you're starting to feel side effects, you go back to the week before you go up on your dose a little bit, tells you how to cut the pills in half. Um, so very useful and, and validated, um, in a clinical trial. This is another study where we use the brochures in hospitalized patients. So they've been studied both in outpatients and in hospitalized patients. And they've also been studied for patients with mild cognitive impairment. Um, they haven't been studied with advanced cognitive impairment. Uh, so for example, there's never been a study where we've given them to care providers, um, but I, I could imagine that they would be effective and that would be an interesting study to do. We are uh, now uh, enrolling to a clinical trial in our hospital. We're, we're going to be um, validating these brochures for the drug class of gabapentinoids. So um, stay tuned for the results of the GABA-Y trial. Um, so we've recruited about 100 out of 160 patients. So we'll be hoping to complete that trial over the next year um, to help get people off of this very uh, tricky drug class of gabapentinoids. So these are medications like opioids. So you can develop um, a physiologic dependency on them. And they do, again, cause side effects like they increase falls, they cause um, uh, changes to cognition, delirium, uh, especially for older adults or people who have, for example, renal dysfunction. Um, we'll be, we're going to be uh, giving them out to people when they're hospitalized, and we're also going to be studying impact on their pain. Um, and uh, this was presented at Choosing Wisely, and it's actually being run by one of our trainees uh, in internal medicine. So it's kind of a cool study because it's trainee-led. Um, and just to give you a, a, another two minutes about gabapentinoids, because I am on a bit of a mission against these medications. This is David Yearling. He's um, kind of fun to follow on Twitter. He does a lot of uh, drug toxicity, but he says, you know, I think this happens a lot more than we realize. Someone's coming in with edema. We give them Lasix. It doesn't help. Their albumin's normal. There's no proteinuria. They get an echocardiogram. The left ventricle is normal. We think they have heart failure, preserved ejection fraction. They give more Lasix, but the edema persists. Maybe we add some endapamide. Um, they get uh, dehydrated. They develop acute kidney injury. And he says, oh, it was pre all along. Um, so we, I do see this happening. This is a case report of someone who was on pre -gabalin. It can cause really impressive edema. Um, this is a case report, but I, I had a young woman uh, in her 40s who developed similar edema on gabapentin and, uh, and deeper scribing. Uh, this is the case report. And for my patient as well, it really did make a difference. So, uh, you know, one of the things you'll notice, the difference between these two pictures. So first of all, less edema, less angry redness from the venous stasis dermatitis. So this was actually inflammatory venous stasis that was causing that redness. But here you'll see she's, she's in bed and in pat. In fact, this patient in the case report was bed bound from the edema. And, and here, you know, one of the most striking things, of course, is that she's up and mobilizing again. Um, the last tools that I want to um, give you access to and draw your attention to are there are deprescribing algorithms. So there's actually guidelines to help get people off certain classes of medications. And these are from deprescribing.org. And there's different apps too that you can download from the app store or that you can get online to help you deprescribe. Um, so, you know, some of the ones that link with the electronic medical record are Taper MD, uh, which is in a similar class as the software that I helped build, which is MedSafer. So these ones link with the electronic medical record. Um, that takes a lot more setting up, right? Because different medical records have different systems. And so you can't just access Taper MD or MedSafer right away. That like really takes like a lot of setting up and IT. Um, but MedStopper is available right away. So if you go to MedStopper, uh, just Google it. This one gives you tapering regimens. And a lot of these tapering regimens are the ones that we've used for Taper MD and MedSafer. Um, and uh, it was developed by a Canadian group, again, uh, freely available, um, built through Delphi Consensus. And if you enter in the medication, 
Um, it'll give you um, recommendations for how to taper and what to watch out for. And then if you go to deeperscribing.org, this is another great reference for you. This one has um, the deeperscribing guidelines. Uh, so this is Barb Farrell or a, a cartoon of her, but she has some uh, uh, on YouTube. You can look at some of her presentations on the deprescribing guidelines, um, but they exist for these classes. So cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine, antipsychotics, sleeping pills, PPIs, and diabetes medications. And the guidelines are all evidence-based. They've been published in peer-reviewed journals. And they have really neat uh, information about things like, does this formulation come in a pill or a capsule? Am I going to be able to cut that medication in half or not? Um, you know, what should I watch out for? And, you know, this is the sum total of the guideline, but of course, a lot of work goes into this final uh, poster. But here's just an example for you um, to get a sense of, you know, just how clear and helpful they are. So this is for the cholinesterase inhibitors. And it's really um, helping you to judge, is the patient getting benefit from it? Is it helping their cognition? Because that's not really who we want to aim to deprescribe in, unless, of course, the harms are outweighing those benefits. And certainly in people who aren't benefiting, um, you know, it'll recommend a, a trial of, of tapering and what to watch out for. Um, and so here it is, you know, it, it has the timing of the symptoms, the different symptoms that could present the possible causes. It tells you about the different strengths that are available. So like, you know, if you're looking to come off of a rivastigmine patch um, and you're on 9.5, you know, the next one would be 4.6. So it, it, I find them very helpful. Um, I mentioned MedStopper before. So you enter in the medication, you put the indication, which could include, I don't know what this medication is for, because let's be honest, a lot of times we can't even figure out the original indication for the medication. And it actually will come up with a plan that you can print out for each of the medications. And it gives you um, a, like a rough guide to tapering and what symptoms to watch out for. Okay, so uh, these were our objectives. List some uh, inappropriate prescriptions, uh, common ones in three populations that are most affected. So women, people who live in a rural region, people in long-term care, those examples, right? Sleeping pills, PPIs, high dose iron, gabapentinoids. Those are really, really common. Um, understand some of the barriers. So we, we talked a lot about the different barriers today. And then hopefully you've got some now practical tools that you can start to, if you're curious, read about, maybe use in your practice that will help to overcome some of these barriers. So that's my that's me on Twitter and my email. These are the websites. Um, that are directly linked to my work. And yeah, feel free to get in touch and happy to take any questions. This was amazing. Um, I ask anybody who has a question to unmute. I do want to ask you what made you think about doing MedSafer? Was it one situation or was just seeing patients over and over again with complications from overprescribing? Yes, uh, great question. So uh, my research is really in the field of high value healthcare. Um, I was raised by a single mom who we did everything on a budget. And when I was training as a resident, I was very conscientious of waste. Um, so for me, that was, uh, that was kind of what drove things. I felt that people were on medications and that complications were occurring that were wasteful and preventable and that there were better ways of doing things. And um, my uh, my colleague, Todd Lee, uh, had a background in IT, and he said, well, you know, you want to address this problem, and I think I have an IT solution, so, you know, we could, we could really put this together, and it, so it was, you know, interest, curiosity, and then opportunity. We were, we were funded, um, fortunately, uh, to run a clinical trial, which helped us to, to build and test the application, so don't, I don't know that we would be here today if uh, if the government of Canada hadn't, you know, believed in the concept um, and funded building MedSafer. Um, that it is really amazing. And I really appreciate all the recommendations for MedStopper and MedSafe, um, MedSafer and the deprescribing um, networks uh, resources. If you wouldn't mind sending me your um 
uh, slides, you can send it in PDF if you prefer. And this way I can distribute them to our providers here. Yeah, definitely. I'm very happy to provide them. Does anyone have any questions? I just want to say thank you. This was a very enlightening, informative presentation. Um, I really appreciate the patient brochures. Actually, I can't wait to go on your site and and see, you know, what those look like. Um, because and I, the name is phenomenal. Patient Empower. Oh wow, <laughs> that's so great. And um, it's just I've thought about the deprescribing. Um, but haven't delved into it, obviously, to the to the depth and an extent that you have. But this is this is just super motivating. And so thank you. Really happy to hear that. Yeah, I feel like there's a real place for this in the functional medicine realm. Um, and I feel like it's just going to explode the more and more people hear about it. It's quite satisfying to stop medications for a patient. It, it, I, it is very satisfying. And, and patients have said, um, there, there, you know, there have been surveys of patients where they've said, what do you, what do you think of this? <laughs> um, and the majority will say, if somebody I trust says it's okay to do this. So if my prescriber says it's safe to come off my medication, of course, I want to come off the medication. It's, you know, it's the minority of patients who are not interested in this. Mm -hmm. Janine, you had a question. Um, I work in the palliative care field, and often, <clears throat> oftentimes the expectation is that I will prescribe more medication. And I had it quite frequently that patients and their families were very surprised that the answer to um, addressing um, unpleasant symptoms was to get rid of medications that might not be um, for example, like you mentioned, with the overly controlled um, A1C and the recurrent hypoglycemia that is affecting mental status and overall functioning, falls, et cetera, but also just things like, um, you know, just never stopping the oxybutynin on somebody who had been diagnosed with an overactive bladder and is suffering significantly from the anticholinergic effects and, you know, just uh, losing more capacity and more functionality without having any relief or being on multiple psychotropic medications for sleep disturbances, et cetera. So I'm a really big fan of all this. And I'm really happy to see that there's a system uh, in place or some resources in place that have um, have a good structure and have some support for the things I've kind of been intuitively doing. Well, and thanks for bringing up the palliative care environment because there are, you know, there are actually a couple of studies in that patient population um, that I, uh, I reference often. One of them is stopping statins, which improved quality of life in people with limited life expectancy. And that was a randomized control trial published in JAMA. So that's a great one with evidence in that population for deprescribing. And then the other one uh, was an RCT where they gave antipsychotics um, and uh, people at end of life who were still able to participate in those discussions actually said that it made them feel worse. Um, you know, so we do try and use a lot of these medications off label and, you know, there certainly, is there a role for, you know, a low dose of Haldol for nausea? Yes. Um, but, uh, but also some, some patients are, are going to feel worse on those medications and we sometimes forget to ask, or we attribute it to the disease itself. Yeah. You know, one of the very common things that, um, if you don't mind me sharing is that people remaining on Aricep, Mementine when they're already institutionalized with dementia. So there's really no, no benefit in continuing it. And especially when we're seeing more of a failure to thrive picture with the GI upset, the impaired appetite, et cetera, where really our focus is, is shifting to just what do people need to function and what was the original purpose of those medications. But oftentimes what we are up against is a really strong marketing campaign of these medications medications where people have an impression of the benefit and it takes a long time to re-educate and to overcome the perception that people have just from what they see on TV. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for sharing that, Janine. That was really important that you said that. Um, again, this has been so great and I may tap you again next year. If you don't mind, you could bring us the um, uh, gabapentin Y study <laughs> and the updated figures that you're getting from your visiting professor. 
Um, the CME for this event is number 58971, 58971. And I will be, again, distributing this to several thousand uh, providers. <laughs> so I'll Great. include you in on it also. Well, thanks again for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank Take you everyone care. for attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. What'd you think, Kylie?